can all sit down. Um, Rob and I are going to read the Bible today because it's a long one, and Jeff suggested two voices could help make it feel more dynamic, so fingers crossed. What's the reference again? John 11, 1 to 45, 44. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi... They said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you were going back. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe... You will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. 
Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. And now we're going to invite Jeff up and I'm going to pray for him. Thank you, Rob, for reading the Bible with me. My name is Beth, by the way. Hey. This is Jeff. And Jeff's going to speak on this mammoth passage, and I'm really excited to hear what he's going to say. (laughs) So, Jesus, will you uh, inspire this man's heart and words as you inspired in the hearts of those who saw you in your day? Uh, Will you help him to proclaim what he knows of you to be true? Uh, Will you help him to decipher this passage and make it applicable to us as we are in our world today? And Jesus, give him peace and wisdom, uh, and yeah, may your glory be declared. In Jesus' name, amen. Right in my ear, that's good. (laughs) I can hear the microphone from here. Good on him. Um, This uh, series on (laughs) on John... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm trying to do a good job. Yes, you're doing a great job. <laughs> there we go. That's good. Yep. This uh, is, a, is a wonderful passage. Very difficult to do uh, justice to it. But uh, for the moment, this is the conclusion of our series on gaining a glimpse of Jesus, the one and only. And the... Uh, if there's a passage to end on where we see a glimpse of Jesus um, very clearly, it would be this one. Um, it's a complex and dynamic passage, um, and uh, there's a lot happening here. We're going to move pretty fast. But uh, just simply to say that what John is doing is two things at once. He's trying to show that uh, Jesus is entirely human and that Jesus is Lord... Actually, he's doing three things. But he, he's trying to show Jesus' lordship, that he is from heaven, through his humanity. In, in other words, he's saying, check him out before you check him off. You know, you can get up close to Jesus and you'll find, here is a fellow that has no peers uh, amongst humanity. And uh, that's really what is happening in this wonderful story. But I'd like to begin by uh, moving to a totally different passage, and that's uh, one well known to us uh, that we often read around Easter out of 1 Corinthians 15, because Paul uh, has the same sort of worldview as John, and uh, he basically has this view that all of humanity uh, is triangulated and constrained by three particular authorities, three principles, if you like. The scriptures call them principalities. Uh, In the Greek, it's the stoichia. And these principalities, there's actually a fourth, but we won't worry about that, but there is sin itself, which we haven't dealt with in this book as yet, and obviously come the next feast of Passover, that's where sin gets dealt with. But we've up till now been dealing a lot with the authority of Jesus relative to the law and that Jesus' authority surpasses that of Moses and the law. And now we move on to this third power. And Paul says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. There's the three powers But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus' ministry is what releases all of humanity who are in him from the domination of those three powers. No longer is our life triangulated by those three trig points of law, sin, and especially death. And this one here today, obviously, we're dealing with the power of death itself and what it does to humans. Maybe we can say a few things about that as we go. But we begin the story with uh, two sisters. We're introduced to three people, Mary and Martha, 
And we're told in verse 2, Mary's the one that anointed Jesus' feet with oil and uh, wiped them with her hair. We, we haven't got that to that story yet. It's in the next chapter. But it's, it's obvious to John that it would be obvious to the readers because they know this woman. She's well known in the church. And their brother gets ill and it's no 24-hour tummy bug. It's something which is dreadfully ill and most likely will lead to his death. And so they write the Lord a letter and they send it. And in those days, if it went by foot or by mule, it would take anywhere from one and a half to two days to get there. So this letter has come while Lazarus is dying. He's dreadfully ill. Jesus gets it and he hears it and he says, this illness doesn't lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. You see, the assumption of Mary and her sister is that human bonds of affection will trip Jesus into action. His buddy is sick, so they're going to call in a favour and that should be enough to get Jesus moving. Now, we're told in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Isn't it a strange thing that he says then immediately? So when he heard that Lazarus is ill, he stays for another two days in the place where he was. If you and I had friends and we got word that a friend of ours was on the brink of death, we would be there like a shot. But Jesus stays because he is taking this material again, this occasion, and turning them into his stage props to display his glory. That's what he's doing. It's also probably, as some of the commentators point out, that he's making sure that according to their superstitions, it's not in the scriptures, but the, many Jews had this view that the soul of a depart, dead person departed anywhere during the first four days. But after four days, it's absolutely hopeless. There's no chance of revivication. And that's what Jesus is making sure. He's making sure that this situation is absolutely hopeless on a human level. And so then he, he, he says, we get into this amazing conversation between him and the boys. And, <clears throat> and he waits for two hours. And then he says, okay, let's go. Let's go to Judea again. And the disciples, and we're not aware of this because we've left chapter 10 out. In the previous chapter, Jesus, after that making the blind see miracle, gets into a stash with the Jews claims that he's the son of God, they pick up stones and they're going to kill him then and there. And so the disciples are basically saying, you're going where? I mean, do you think that's prudent to head back to that place where just to, you know, who knows? A few weeks ago, they're going to stone you. You, you. Really? Is that a great idea? And Jesus basically comes out with this statement, well, there's 12 hours in a day and if you walk in the light... You're okay. Uh, you know, you're in the light. And Jesus has this confidence that basically he is in the eye of God's will. And this is not his time. Uh, you know, those who walk in the dark, their life is random. But if you walk in the light, then... And it's a favourite phrase of John himself later on in his epistles. So then he tells them, you see, Lazarus has fallen asleep... And I'm going to go and wake him up. And the disciples are going, this, this has to be a joke. Yeah, I mean, you're going to move back into a really dangerous zone. You're going to take a two-day walk to wake a guy from a nap. Now, most people don't need help to wake up, <laughs> let alone someone to come from, you know, 100 k's away to give him a little shake and wake him <laughs> and uh, you see, they're not very good at poetry or metaphor. They take Jesus literally, and so he has to put it out plainly. Now, Lazarus is dead, and he knows that Lazarus is dead. I don't know how, but he knows that the spirit has departed, that this guy is 
finito. He is dead. And so let's go. And Thomas, we read, typical Stoic Thomas, stands up straight and with bravado says, well, let's go then and we'll die with him, you know, beyond the barricade. Captain, my captain. <laughs> and he's going to, he's going to go and uh, he speaks for a lot of them. They think this is not going to end well. This is not a good place to be. Finally, we read in verse 17 that Jesus arrives at Bethany and he's out of the city limits. And the mourning has already begun, not M-O-R, but M-O-U-R-N. And in those days, that was a big event. You had to mourn properly. And, and there were a whole lot of people, your relatives would come from miles around and the whole township would gather to mourn. They'd get out the hankies, they would make themselves look dreadful and, and it was sort of like you had a um, you know, professional uh, wake following you around, rent a, went a, rent a wake. And these, this rent a wake is there, ready, and Jesus walks to the edge of town and Martha, Martha, she's been waiting for him and he hasn't arrived. They sent word... He could have got on his bike right then, but he didn't. And she is spitting chips. And we've got to understand that this is a very human... We tend to sanctify these words and and put them in stained glass, this conversation. This is a very rough and human conversation happening here. And Martha, she has been thinking about this. She's been festering on this for a few days. And... And she comes up to him and her logic is a bit like a tossed salad and she she basically says, you know, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. And secondly, I know that whenever you pray, heaven hears, dot, 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 ergo, you haven't even prayed. Or else something would have happened. You don't care. What sort of friend are you? She is angry with this so-called Messiah. He had other things better to do than to help his friend. And Jesus says, look, your brother will rise again. And he can barely get the words out. And she's basically saying, well, fat lot of good that's going to do, you know. She thinks he's talking theology. He's away with the theological fairies. I know that he will rise on the last day. You know, da-da-da-da-da. You know, salute the flag of the resurrection. Yeah, I'm an Orthodox Jew. Jesus came. It's not a general principle of resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is not some law that's burrowed into history. It's not part of the great dialectic. It's me. If anyone rises, it's because I am the principle of the resurrection. And and he spells it out pretty clearly. It's not some impersonal principle. It's my personal intervention. If anyone rises. And she comes out at that point with some sort of evangelical greeting card confession. Profession. She goes, yes, 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 yes. You're the Messiah, blah, 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 blah. You're the Son of God, whatever rocks your boat. And then immediately she goes off and calls Mary. She says, isn't it interesting? The rabbi's asking for you. One, he wasn't. And two, he's much more than a rabbi. And so Mary is beyond herself with grief. They react to grief differently, these sisters. Jesus is still out there at the city limits. There's been no... Fresh warm towels, no cup of tea and cake, none of the usual hospitality. He's, he's been insulted. He's been left at the edge of the city. And Mary rushes out there, rent awake, suddenly sees her shoot off and thinks she's going to the grave. Oh, and we can't miss out on the big grave scene. So they're off following Mary like a swarm of bees. And, but she goes out to Jesus, this one who in the next chapter understands Jesus and wipes his 
feet with her, her hair. Now she falls down at his feet, absolutely gutted. And she says the same thing. She has the same assumptions theologically as her sister. And tragically, there she is with red eyes and matted hair, an absolute facial mess. If only you'd been here, you could have done something. You see her assumption? Now the hour is up. It's too late. The situation is even beyond you. It's hopeless. You know, isn't it interesting, and I think it's fascinating, the fact that grief and loss, even for our pets, leaves us gutted, let alone for those who are dear to us. It's astonishing that, I think, that if we were mere products of molecular collisions in a world that just thought itself into being billions of years ago, if that's reality, I don't think it is, then you would think that over time, like all the other reflexes which we have, we would have developed a valve for dealing with grief. If I'm cold, I shiver automatically. If I'm hot, I perspire and I cool myself down. If I'm bereaved, I fall apart. And people die of broken hearts. It just hasn't happened. There we have Mary as a typical griever. And then Jesus steps in. And here we have a glimpse of this one and only. Raw and undiluted. And Jesus sees this particular scene of, of sheer wrecked humanity and in that moment he also sees that this is the human condition under that principality called death and this doesn't only mean that he grieves this revolts him and he he starts having a physiological reaction and the words that are used there are the deepest emotional words in the Greek language. The, Jesus is deeply indignant here that this power of death is rendering the pinnacle of his creation. The image of God that he had so much, many ideas for in helpless disarray. All of humanity is pictured in this scene. And death, my friends, is not a time to be strong and stoic. The scriptures do not say, accept death, shake hands with death. Death is part of life, I hear at so many funerals. It's just a different energy state. Death is an imposter. And it was never part of God's great plan that we would taste it. And in this moment, John writes that Jesus shudders again. The tectonic plates of the cosmos are moving past each other as in the very heart of Jesus Christ. This is the centre point of the universe. And will it hold? Jesus bursts into tears and he groans with indignation all at the same time. It is one volcanic moment in scripture. And then he moves in the crowd see Jesus weeping too. And pathetically, they go, oh, romantically. Oh, he's missing his pal. Isn't that sweet? Oh, dear. He must have really loved him after all. That's all they can see. But the whole idea as they debate, you know, couldn't he have come a bit earlier? Couldn't have the guy who did that last miracle in John 9, couldn't have he... If he could make eyes see that have never seen, couldn't he have, have stopped this guy? But you see the crowd too are working off the common human assumption that death is the final authority. 
that you cannot beat this enemy. The principality rules. I mean, the law, that's one thing. Yeah, that's good. Sin, well, don't know about that. But death, no. That's a big one. You can't get past that one. And right then, Jesus decides to take charge. And he tells them to go and take the stone away, some large boulder away from this cave. It was probably a, a buried down into the rock, this grave. And they protest, and particularly Martha, the ultimate pragmatist, she, she protests loudly, and, and I like it, I was saying this morning, and I like the authorised version here, where it says that Martha says, O oh Lord, he stinketh. And <laughs> I, uh, I think that's one you can put on your mother-in-law's law's, um, Christmas card this year, <laughs> just put the text there. <laughs> Maybe save it up for a good occasion, but it's a wonderful verse, wonderful verse. And um, so she is there, and uh, she thinks this is a bad idea. And, and I think at this stage, none of the crowd expect anything. They think what? They've rolled the stone away. They think Jesus wants a viewing. <laughs> he wants to go in and see his pal. Now that's grieving. I tell you, that's six points. Let's get it right there. And that's all their thinking that's happening here. The guy is overcome and he wants to go and see Lazarus who's all bound up and dead. And Jesus then says, you know, I told you, you were going to see the glory of God at work. And you're going to see it today. And then he lifts his eyes to heaven and he prays. But did you notice his prayer? He doesn't actually ask for anything. He says in verse 41, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. It's a thanks prayer. I knew that you always hear, hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they might believe that you sent me. So the reason why I'm saying this, this is just between you and me, right? But let's do it for them. But he doesn't actually ask that. He just cuts off and goes straight, because he knows that he and the Father and their will they're like that. They're one. He doesn't need to ask. Heaven is implicated in what is about to happen. And everyone is watching Jesus. And then and right at that moment, he yells out. And get ready. <laughs> and he says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. And they'd be watching him and they'd think, oh, isn't that sad? You know, it's, uh, you know, everyone has different ways of dealing with grief and, you know, Japanese yell from mountaintops and Scots skull a few and, you know, and, and this is his thing and that's the way he's doing it. Yeah, you know, I'm sad. And, you know. and he is summoning Lazarus and where are people watching? They're watching Jesus. Not an eyeball goes off him and they're not... You know, this is uh, obviously the denial phase here, you know, and he, he uh, thinks that Lazarus can hear and that's what grief does, you know. And they're watching Jesus, then out of the peripheral vision, something white is moving and the whole crowd shifts their gaze and they see this figure that they buried a week ago, stumbling towards Jesus, penguin-like, and 11 herbs and spices starting to fall out of his bandages. And no one says a word, no one says a hallelujah, they can't get any breath in to say anything. Yet he breathes and walks. And Jesus is the only one who seems to understand the moment and he turns pragmatic and says, well, get the guy out of his grave so close, somebody. You know, let's get to it. Here we have 
the glory of God in a very human situation, in a very human Jesus. And we understand who he is. And that's what John wants us to be the takeaway of us to appreciate who Jesus really is in the cosmos, in the greatest terms of anything. You see, John, like Paul, is saying, when Jesus walks on the scene, the law is decommissioned, it's put out of action, because the word of God has arrived. It's saying, sin will be dethroned, because the Lamb of God sits upon the throne. And it's saying, death shall be defanged because Jesus is the living Lord. The resurrected one is the resurrecting one. There's no resurrection except his say-so. And I just love that thought that that day Lazarus heard the voice of Jesus from the grave, which is a little picture of exactly what you are. And I know it. If you are in him, you are going to experience the same thing. That moment you die, and it might be tonight, it might be in 70 years' time. But die you will. And the next thing that you will experience subjectively is the audible sound of the voice of Jesus. Bill, get up, come forward. Adam, time to rise. Martha, come on, come forward. Oliver, come, arise. He will summon you personally. That is our hope. The world does not have that, but that's our expectation. Not an impersonal power, not a delegated power, not the power of positivity thinking, not faith in faith itself, but the person, this person of Jesus Christ in history will meet you again at the end of history. But this is not a principle just about the end of time. If John has been telling us anything again and again and again through each of these sign parables, it's the way Jesus operates in the world now that he is the resurrection and the life. I mean, you see what he's saying here? That here he has defeated the final foe the ultimate foe that no one thinks can be defeated. But death is nothing to him. And the Jesus of John is a Jesus who loves to display his glory through the plot and purpose of our lives, through the materials of our lives. He takes opportunity to glorify himself through things such as our disappointments our griefs, and even our failings. There is no person here tonight that is a hopeless case because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. If death is the ultimate principality and that has been defeated, then our peccadillo is a small beer by comparison. This Jesus is our life. Where we go from here, well, our life really matters because of this day. Not because of great things that we can do, but what he can do with the dry morsels of our lives that we put into his hands. Life becomes an adventure That when we get to the end and they open the great book of salvation history, 
it will be seen that you had a playing role, not a bit part. That's the adventure that he calls us to. That calls for a, a celebratory way to live. Tonight, the words of um, that great missionary, Jim Elliot, come to my mind. That he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let's live the adventure recklessly. Risk it all. That's the only way to live if Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this guy, John, and his vivid memory that allows us to get a glimpse of yourself, the one who reigns on high, but also, Lord, the one who gathers us here tonight and enjoys our fellowship as we meet together. Lord, assure us this day that these powers of the law and sin and death itself hold no sway over us because they hold no sway over you. Lord, for ourselves or for those in our lives, we commit them to prayer with the confidence that there is no such thing as a hopeless situation or a hopeless case. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.